Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I know it's Monday and um, we probably had a busy weekend, but we wanted to thank you for tuning in to the first of our webinars for this year. Um, my name is Julia Tambari. I'm the Marketing Communications Coordinator over at Brown Paper Tickets in the Seattle office. Today's webinar is called After Hours, How to Turn Your Empty Space into an Event Space. And we're really happy that our food and farm coordinator, Chef Patrick Nelson, is here today this morning to talk to us about how to bring in business during slow periods and times when your space, restaurant, or venue is underutilized. So Chef Patrick has been with Brown Paper Tickets for seven years now. Um, and he's also the owner of Crow's Feet Farmstead which is a local family farm in Everett, Washington. And since purchasing the land five years ago, Patrick has thrown tons of events from dinner pop-ups to large scale festivals. So welcome Patrick. Um, I thought it'd be fun if you could tell the audience a couple <clears throat> things about some of these photos, like who these adorable children are. <laughs> uh, thanks Julia. Uh, good morning everybody. Um, yeah, so I do own and operate a small farm about 30 miles north of Seattle. Um, <clears throat> some of these pictures are just pictures that we've taken around the farm. Um, in fact, the, the two cute kids in this picture right here are my daughters. Um, and then up pictured above is my oldest daughter, Pepper, and my wife, Amy. Uh, and we're kind of having a little dinner. Uh, yes, it's just apple cider, not hard cider. Um, <laughs> so um, a little bit about the farm and about me. Um, yes, I, I am a chef. Uh, I did spend about 20 years in the restaurant industry um, in kitchens of various types. Um, however, for those of you that aren't in the restaurant industry, this webinar is still for you. Um, <clears throat> through my time at Brown Paper Tickets, I've also worked with thousands of event organizers of all kinds. And I've actually found uh, the information that we're gonna to share today to be pretty universal. Um, in fact, I would say, even if you are an event producer that doesn't have a space, there's probably some valuable information in here for you. Um, and a lot of it's just sharing my experiences. Um, I'm also gonna make my email and contact information available after this webinar, um, if you'd like to follow up with me afterwards. So we can kind of just get started here. Yeah, so Patrick has had the opportunity to um, attend several culinary events throughout Washington and the nation. Um, as you mentioned, he's a seasoned chef and he recently represented Washington State at this year's Flavored Nation in Columbus. What did you make for that, Patrick? Uh, we did a cedar plank salmon, uh, which um, is kind of the iconic state dish that they chose for Washington State. Um, and I did it North Pacific Northwest style is what I would call it, um, by which I included berries and um, farm fresh greens and forest greens from our farm. Cool, I'm sure it was delicious. I know that he killed it. So um, super <laughs> excited about that. So yeah, like we said, um, Patrick is gonna be talking to us about using your commercial space for special events. Um, during the webinar, we're gonna cover why events can help your business, how you can use your space for events, choosing an event that fits, assessing your resources and how to get started in planning. So Patrick is going to give us his talk. In the meantime, please make sure your microphones are muted until the Q&A session following the presentation. Um, like I said earlier in the chat box, I'll sort of be moderating the comment section throughout. So if you guys have questions, feel free to um, make sure your chat settings are set to panelists and attendees. Feel free to send us questions in the chat um, and I'll address them afterwards. So um Patrick off to you oh thanks so through through um, my career I worked with a wide variety of different types of restaurants um, some small family owned operated places um, high volume by night chains supper clubs um, nightclubs bakeries um, and even hotels um, through through all of those uh, experiences one thing was true it, and this was that all of those businesses at times suffered from slow periods um, of business this uh, particular image here that you're looking at is in a market in olympia and um, there was a rather successful uh, bread baker there who has other restaurants that are still actually crushing it um, but this particular business was a crepery um, this was taken during the weekday um, this 
sadly, uh, this uh, business did eventually close. Um, but the reflection that I bring from it is, you know, what could they have done to maybe s slow down or save that? Um, it was it possible and, and things like that. And that's kind of how my mind works. So um, not only is it easy, uh, particularly easy for restaurants to atrophy during these times, almost any type of business can. Um, the financial and emotional stamina that's needed to keep a business open um, can be a challenge of its own. Uh, but there are alternative revenue streams uh, that when you approach them correctly uh, can save your bacon. And that's kind of what I'm going to try to talk about a little bit today. <clears throat> so um, I remember when I was first starting out um, in, in cooking, I worked for this little family owned mom and pop kind of spot in Portland. Um, and it was basically these two brothers and then mom and dad who ran the shop I, seven days a week, open to close, and they tried to be open for lunch and dinner seven days a week. Um, when they hired me on, they really couldn't afford much, uh, but they brought me on anyways because the one of the brothers worked full times for, he was a butcher, he worked for uh, Albertsons, I believe, and the other brother was a restaurant manager and managed another bar and restaurant um, in Portland. So when they brought me on, they really needed to get the bang for their buck out of it. So needless to say, I kind of worked my butt off for them. Um, but despite our best efforts, there just wasn't quite enough volume of business. And then after about six months or so, um, they were faced with this dilemma of whether they could afford to keep me on or not. So at that time, it was basically up to me to determine what I should do, whether it be Um, ultimately, we decided to try to do some special events, add on, you know, what you would typically see in a lot of restaurants. So they started with happy hours. Um, I added on a brunch uh, menu on the weekends. Um, this was close to Portland State University, so we were trying to get a lot of the college crowd in there. Um, you know, it was Mediterranean type food, so it was hip. It was only about 35 seats. So we were kind of like playing off of that. Um, the brunch did pretty well. Um, but it still wasn't quite making up enough of the revenue. Um, so we started doing open mic nights. Um, and that actually brought in enough revenue to keep us open for almost two years beyond that. So that was kind of my introduction to hosting events in general and kind of learning how to kind of trial and error, fumble my way through, you know, you know adding some revenue streams to this business. Um, this particular image that you're looking at now is a, is a completely separate business that's also to be in Portland, Oregon, um, the Hop House. And uh, this is like a chain of family friendly um, draft uh, tap house, you know, and they do something um, that they take it through brown paper tickets called Cider Fest. And Cider Fest is basically where they find all these up and coming cider makers. They invite them and they host this festival, which brings in hundreds of attendees. They sell tickets for it. It not only keeps them relevant with the cider community, it also gives them that additional little nudge, you know, once a year they get that little bit of extra income, maybe it pays property taxes or, you know, whatever end of the year stuff that they have to figure out. So this is a best case example. Um, the restaurant I was referring to a moment ago, Ziva, that might've been like kind of your worst case uh, example because ultimately that restaurant did close. Um, however, you know, what I'm trying to say is you gotta keep trying until you find what fits. So whether it be you know, a class, a release party. There's so many different types of events that you can do. Um, so what you do need to do is try to just kind of keep plugging away until you find out what works for you. Um, there's lots of different ways to approach it. So it will take you some time. It takes a little trial and error. Um, but you know, in the early days, you know, I, it's, it's easy to, to, to kind of wean yourself off of you know, your, your bad habits of, you know, I'm just going to come in and open. If I'm not busy enough on Monday, maybe I close on Mondays. So that's the atrophy part. Um, once you start to cut your hours back, cut labor, and, and like maybe try to, to swing it with one less line cook, you know, some of those can be smart decisions. But once you start to, to take away public open hours, um, it's hard to put those back in as your customers get trained into not coming in on Monday. Um, so make an honest and thorough list of what you can do, um, you know, your skills 
uh, your strengths and your personal resources. Um, you know, ask around, I would say, uh, you know, talk to friends and family. Um, but just the most important thing is to be just brutally honest with yourself. Do I even have the bandwidth to host events? Maybe not, you know, um, how serious is it? Is it, how soon do I need this revenue, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then, then once you do that, uh, for example, uh, like if you realize you're, you're really good at making pasta uh, from scratch or something and you're in your charismatic and you like to talk to people, um, maybe teach a pasta making class. Maybe that would be a good fit. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that you're going to want to look at going into it. Um, it is just be honest. Maybe you feel more comfortable in a managerial role where maybe you're not the talent of the event, but you can find other uh, people in other ways to bring that in. Um, for example, you know, when I was also at Ziba, we, like I said, we started doing an open mic night. I didn't run that open mic night myself. You know, I helped with it. I was, I'm a musician as well. So at the time I was into it, but I kind of found students at the, at the college and the musicians that were most interested in having the open mic night, I kind of let them run it, you know, and in the long run, what that did was that not only guaranteed that there was interest in it and that it would happen because it was their night. They also brought in their own group of, of customers. So rather than trying to force, you know, some 30 somethings in to come in and hear a jazz trio that might not work and then you have to pay the band and everything like that. I let them kind of run it. And then all of their friends would come and invite their friends and invite their friends and so on. So it actually started to pick up a little bit of momentum after a while and, you know, started to work a little bit, you know, um, until they wanted to buy a new PA, but that's a, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, you know, take inventory of what your, your strengths are, your skills, what you have. I mean, do you have an old PA sitting around in the basement from your punk rock band back, back when you were in your twenties? Dust that sucker off, bring it down, you know, see, see what you can have, you know, ask around, like I said, your friends and family, is there, a, is there a young person in your life that is passionate about something like music or poetry or, or even trivia or something like that? All of these things um, can convert into marketing um, and all of these things that you'll see in a lot of sports bars, they do trivia nights and bingo even is somehow making a, a big comeback, but uh without getting in the weeds too much here, what I'm trying to say is, is don't close yourself off to opportunities and be honest with yourself. And that includes, you know, what are you most comfortable doing? Um, this particular image is a class that I taught at a local community center. Um, so when I was working at the, with this community center, I came in there and uh, basically they had one class. Um, when I started working with them, this is just down in South Seattle. And, you know, I went in there and I said, you know, what, what does it, what can I do to help you grow this? And they said, well, we just need people to come in. We need people to, to, to teach the classes. And I said, well, you know, I could come teach a class, you know, on, I think this was a uh, pozole um, that we were making in this class. So, um, you know, I would come in once a month or so and, and, and volunteer my time to teach the class. But if I were that person out there that, wasn't volunteering, there could be a partnership in this example. Um, for example, maybe this isn't a community center, maybe it's a restaurant space, or maybe it's a raw space, and I'm still a chef, but instead of volunteering, I wanna charge this amount for the tickets, and we split it, and you know, we work it out to where it's economically viable for both parties. Um, for the venue fee, maybe you get 50% or 25% or something, and that's something that you would work out with each individual situation. Um, the example is, I was comfortable teaching the classes more than I was comfortable finding other chefs at the time. So, you know, whereas I could have gone out and just tried to find somebody else to do it, I, I said, well, I'm going to just roll up my sleeves and give it a shot myself. So ultimately, you know, you might not have time or energy to do it yourself, but there's somebody out there like me or somebody maybe that you already know in your life that is going to be able to. So the first place you might want to look is um, on your own team. So you, you ask yourself, hey, do others on my team have skills? You know, if so, what are they willing to do to help out on events? Um, this gentleman in the picture here is a friend of mine uh, named Nick. 
and Nick is a bartender for a lot of a lot of kind of upscale restaurants in Seattle. And he's been around in the restaurant industry for, I actually worked with him probably about 16 years ago. Um, and he was, I think at the time, just serves waiting tables and, and then busing and things like that uh, at that time. And now he's kind of like the go-to guy that when, you know, his restaurant group opens up a restaurant, they send him in to come up with cocktails and kind of feel out the crowd and adjust the menu and, and make things sing. Um, Nick, uh, also, interestingly enough, is part of a collaborative uh, pop-up supper club here in Seattle. Um, and it's called Rough Draft, if you're interested in checking it out. Um, and what they do is they go into all kinds of strange, funky places like warehouses and like, you know, people's living rooms and things like that. And they host these really super elegant high-end dinners. Um, so, you know, he also has collaborated with his restaurant group and, and done pop-ups at their restaurants. And now, so, so you'll see, maybe you're starting to see where I'm going with this. If his boss wouldn't have said, hey, you know, what are you, what are you up to this weekend, Nick? And Nick says, well, you know, I'm doing this pop-up. Oh, really? What kind of pop up? If that conversation doesn't happen, if you're not asking your team and the people in your in your business, you know, what they're what they're up to, what they're passionate about, you might not have known that Nick was so, so on fire doing these cool pop ups and would have not given him the opportunity to have him do pop ups in his restaurant. You know, he's filling when you're doing a pop up like that, he's filling that restaurant with all new faces, you know, and they're in like you can only sell so many tickets for something like that. So you're turning that over. So it's like first come, first serve, and it creates a supply and demand um, thing that could really be beneficial um, marketing wise. Um, it can really help help out with like that, that exponential growth that you're looking for as a, as a restaurant or any other type of business. Um, <clears throat> another aspect to consider is um, can I leverage outside contacts for an event? Uh, meaning like, so maybe you have a wine purveyor, a butcher, uh, local farmers or chefs and, and other folks that you know, maybe just in passing, or maybe it's actually your butcher down, down at the corner. Um, and can you kind of collaborate with them, maybe bring them into your space, or maybe once again, if you are an event producer that doesn't have a space, flip that. You know, if that's something where you're, you're an event producer and you have this cool concept that you're just dying to do, you know, maybe you know somebody down the road that has the perfect space and you've gone out and you've looked around in your neighborhood and you've checked out all these different spaces and you met the owners or the managers and it made these contacts. And then your next move is to go ahead and just get on out there and ask them, you know, um, they, the worst thing that anybody can ever tell you is no if you, you know, present an opportunity to them. So I would say go ahead and, and get out there into your community and, and check out what people are doing. Um, <clears throat> this um, um, young lady in the picture here is also a friend of mine. She's down in Portland. Uh, her name's Stacy Givens. Um, interesting side note about Stacy is that she won that show Chopped, um, which is something I really like to watch that show. Um, <laughs> but um, before that, she was, she's a chef. Uh, in Portland, worked in a lot of nice restaurants and a lot of small restaurants and things like that. And um, her story is that she also was passionate about urban farming. So she was farming in the Northeast neighborhood or Northeast area of Portland. She was farming, I think like two acres in this lot. She just had this little lot that she was leasing from somebody who didn't want to build anything on it because they liked it to be an open space. Um, they considered using it as the park space. And so Stacy went in and started farming. So after she won Chopped, you get like $10,000 or whatever, you get a little piece of money. She built an outbuilding. Uh, it's like basically a tin barn, but she had it all plumbed up and set up for as a commercial kitchen. So now Stacy is now running all these special events. She does brunches, she does bike and movie nights, she does classes, um, just about any kind of event you could imagine. So she's like the dream a vision of, of event of those types of events, you know, um, and, and before that though, uh, she told me that she would go do these types of events at other people's places before she had the, the, the resources before she had this, the kind of the infrastructure in place. 
So before Stacy had the infrastructure in place, she was hustling these events and doing these cool things. Um, and then once it came to fruition for her and she was living her dream, she started doing it on her farm, but she keeps doing it at other places too because it's marketing, it, it, it gets her out there. She can go to a pop-up, do a pop-up at a restaurant, bring all of her produce and all of her ingredients and do her dishes there and then say, oh, and by the way, my farm's right up the road, come check me out too. And that cross promotion really, I mean, I don't know how to, how to explain that. It's just this, the most valuable thing that I've found. Um, and it's not just in the food industry, once again, I mean, it could, it could tie over into like theater arts or any other type of industry that's, that needs space and talent. You know, you have space, you have talent, you need to combine those two things. So once again, from whatever side of that you are on, um, it should be valuable to, to uh, do that. Um, if you have special equipment, um, so unique facilities, special equipment, I mean, this could, this could go for maybe you have a historic building you know, that you're in, you know, um, here in Seattle, we have like the underground tours, you know, where the city was built on top of a section of the old city where it had burned down. So you can actually go underground and check out sections of what used to be old Seattle, which is a really like cool tourist attraction. Um, the people that own those bars or own those spaces, those buildings or release them, they set that all up. You know, that was something that they took advantage of instead of just keeping it funky and old and leaving it down there and just closing it off to the world, they saw an opportunity for events. So they're selling tickets for people to come, go down underneath and check that out. Or in this instance, this is a little um, dairy down in Tenino, which is near Olympia, Washington, um, Tuna Worth Creamery. And they are very small and they do pasteurization, they do cream, milk, um, cheese, and they make cheeses and things like that. Um, and so just doing a tour of their dairy, their small dairy and seeing how they make cheese or see how they age cheese, things like that, they can capitalize on that um, on its own because they, they have a unique equipment that people don't know how to use. Um, you can teach, like if you have a special type of pasteurization tank um, for example, maybe teaching a workshop on how to use that specific tank. Um, my friends that I mentioned, or I think, I don't know if I mentioned them earlier, but I have friends in, also in Olympia that have a gelato shop and they have this special Italian gelato machine that's like, you know, pretty expensive, like $15,000 or something for this thing. And uh, it's this, it was shipped over from Italy. It's just like, nobody else has this thing. And so, for example, they could also do a, do a class on how to run the specific type of machine. I mean, people would travel from all over the country to do that kind of thing. So look at all of your resources, um, not just human resources, not just people, not just talent, but you might just have something really cool that people want to check out. And th that's an opportunity for an event in, in and of itself. Okay. So your space, and this is for those of you who are specifically listening because you have a space, um, it can be converted, it can be changed. Um, so you wanna look at how many people you can fit in there um, in different layouts, different formats. It's not just, you know, I have a 35 seat bistro or, you know, I have a, a gymnasium. Um, try to consider what you it could be with a little bit of elbow grease and maybe some different you know, uh, resources that you might need. Like, you know, if I brought in, if I went and rented, and you can rent chairs for like a buck fifty a piece sometimes. If I went and got, you know, a hundred chairs, could I set it up like auditorium style and have a small, you know, uh, play in my in my space? Or the opposite, I have too many tables and chairs, and I want to just have a cocktail mixer. Um, you know, can I can I kind of rent storage or find storage on, on my property or somewhere to get my tables and chairs out of there to have a cocktail mixer and again do like a singles mixer or a, a business professional mixer in my place, um, some sort of community gathering. This particular image is um, I work with the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op, and they recently opened a um, beautiful new facility um, there in Sacramento. Um, and this was one of the events for their grand opening. Um, so 
basically this room, uh, as you can see, it looks like office space. Well, because it basically is, it was a office space slash classroom space. And if you look really closely, you can see the tracks on the ceiling where they have divider walls that go up. So they opened this up, you know, they brought in a couple of waist high cocktail tables. Um, they put some other tables around the edge with buffet food items, and, uh, which I helped them with. Um, and they were able to get this kind of cocktail mixer vibe out of this space, um, although it was kind of previously kind of storage or, or stuffy office space. They had to move a bunch of stuff out of there. Is, is, the, is the point of that. If you would have gone there day before this picture was taken, you, it would have been cut into thirds. <laughs> the room would have been cut into thirds and you would have seen big piles of paper and storage and items in each room. So you want to definitely take stock of your own space. Um, maybe if your space just won't hold the type of event you have in mind, revert back to what I would recommend for the folks that are, um, in fact, not having a space and are looking for a space and look at your neighbors. Look at how can you collaborate with other businesses? Maybe go in on an event with another um, venue owner that's near you. So as a chef and, and, and any other endeavor that I've taken on, especially events, um, lists are always your friend. <laughs> so I taught another web webinar about um, class uh, teaching classes um, and basically this is the most true statement I can give you is that take inventory on paper write lists keep track of them don't lose your lists. some um, maybe invest in a good notebook um, and keep all of your lists in one place um, and cross-reference them with each other um, often and update them and if a list becomes too messy rip that sucker right out of the book and uh, rewrite it or type it if that's what, if you must. I find that a hard copy is the best way to go um, because it actually, first of all, your hard drive can't be damaged. I mean, you can damage the paper, but it's just been my tried and true. Um, this is a particularly important for your resources that once again, like, so do you have chairs? How many? Do you need chairs? How many? Um, plates, forks, knives, napkins, um, any, any item that you will need or any item that your talent might need. Um, maybe you have somebody singing some opera um, in your restaurant and that might seem like it doesn't need much. They don't even need a microphone, but do they like a like particular kind of ball of water? Or, you know, what, what is it that, that you don't want to overlook that kind of stuff. So take, taking inventory, take a lot of notes. Um, detailed notes, draw pictures, even if you can't draw. You can tell uh, this is actually from a dinner that I did on my farm um, in my living room. So on the farm, we don't have like a separate event space really. So we basically converted our, li our living room, which is pretty large, into a dining room. And then when we have events, we pull our couches out of there and stuff and all of our personal effects come out and then the decor that's in there is nice enough and it has a lot of farm kitschy you know cool stuff that's like antique -y. and then we put our tables in um and we could do these larger dinners well you can tell that you know i'm not the best artist in the world from my sketches on the left for my dishes that i did um but i understood what it meant you know i knew what each item was going to be and it, get, and it was a clear enough represent, representation that I was comfortable with going back and referencing those when I was actually getting ready to put together the plates. Once again, this is two pages out of maybe 60 that I did for this one single dinner. You know? <laughs> so that doesn't even count shopping lists and <laughs> this is just like the preliminary stages of, of planning. So lots of lists, uh, keep track of that and cross-reference it. And if you have other people working with you, have them look at the list, like physically. Don't don't just hide it to yourself. Be like, okay, can you look at the shopping list, and uh, Julia, and tell me, you know, can you think of anything that I'm missing? You know, because you'd be surprised, and then that can that can really save you. Um, at the last minute, you you go, oh, I did get bottled water for that singer. It's right there. So, take notes. Um, this is something. So, checking your calendars and well, any event listing. So um, 
event websites like brown paper tickets, um, any kind of community bulletin boards online, um, and your own calendars, including your staff or your team, your family, other people's calendars in your life. Um, you want to make sure that you check all of those and once again, make, make a list or make a, make a flow chart. I like to make a flow chart with that and then go, okay, so I kind of like, if I'm looking at this calendar, I'm looking at, I want to do it on a Friday. So I'm looking at the 5th, the 12th of June or the 10th of July from what I can see here that are open. Now, what, what am I going to take into consideration? Well, if, if I go with the, with the July date, it's kind of right after the 4th of July. So people might be tuckered out, might want a weekend off, you know? And so that alone, these are just holidays that are normally falling on the calendar. That alone is something to consider when you add in, you know, is the, is the restaurant up the street having a special event? Is something playing at the local theater that I should consider? Um, is there is there some sort of like is, our, is it voting day you know is there some sort of chamber of commerce meeting that that's important you so basically what i'm saying is check every calendar you can think of um and do it with plenty of advance notice i mean before you post your event online on brown paper tickets or wherever you decide you want to post it make sure that you check and double check all those dates ask around see if there's anything that conflicts with it um, we do an annual farm party uh, every year. It's like a summer cel celebration that we do up at Crossy Farmstead. And um, this year, uh, we had planned it well in advance, and I'd done all of this research and you know and settled on a date. We usually do it in August, which is a tough pull because August is really busy. Um, but this local music festival that's really popular near us it's called the Summer Meltdown. They announced their their date like. A, couple of few weeks before their event and it was the same date <laughs> it's our event so I, I even though i had done all of this it can still happen where it gets to where there's some competition it's not always a bad thing because if, if you're if you're one of two major decisions like two major events that are going on in somebody's life and they have to make that hard decision that means you're doing something right you know and, and you're doing something even even better if they actually choose to come to your event over that event so you know, watch what you're doing, watch the calendars. And um, when you post that stuff, go back through and then make sure that the same way you checked all of those calendars, you post your event to all of those different calendars. So make sure all of your friends know that, that you know, this is happening on that day. You know, blast it out there. Get it on the community bulletin boards. Get it on your chamber of commerce bulletin board um, or whatever if you're a member or whatever you need to do get it on as many different calendars and scrolls as you can um, to ensure that people see it and then you know then promote 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 and start promoting just getting the word out and making sure that you don't have conflict so we're getting we're getting close to wrapping up here and i'm not sure where we're at for time um but one of the most important things um, that i can can really think of um aside from what we've already covered is treating your event even if it's a single even if it's a brunch um treat it like it's a it's a new business like it's, a, it's your most exciting new like you're opening a fresh brand new brand um you know you you should be excited like want to make stickers and hats and you know <laughs> like throw everything you can behind it you know, you, especially they, if you have the energy to do it or if you have somebody else that has the energy to help with that you know so come up with a fun catchy name um you know treat it like a new brand and and really dedicate to it once you find something that you like um and get it out there you know if you have the the bandwidth for art or, or anything like that, that helps. You know, the, the shows that have really cool posters, everybody wants the poster, for example. Um, so anything that you can do to market that in, with, with a catchy branded appeal um, is really gonna be, be a plus. Um, you don't have to just look at it like, oh, we're doing this dinner next week. You're like, we're doing this, uh, I did a, um, a it was a New Orleans themed or a Southern themed luncheon at the farm one time because I just had a wild hair for a muffalata sandwich, you know, and 
I've been to I've been to New Orleans and I have friends down there and it's a specific type of sandwich that needs a specific type of bread. So my obsession was figuring out how to make this bread. First of all, I want to make the sesame bread that they have, um, which by the way is pretty close to pizza dough if, if anybody's interested and with some sesame seeds and egg wash. Um, so uh, I, w I decided I was going to do a lunch. I had some Cafe Du Monde, a can of Cafe Du Monde coffee. Um, so I made beignets, you know, made these muffalata sandwiches and uh, chips. I made like, they have Zaps down in the South, it's a brand of chips. So I tried to recreate Zaps from scratch. And it was, it was a lot of fun uh, culinarily for me. Um, but when it came time to brand it and market it, I'm like, how do I get people to come out? Because I normally just do this farm fresh thing. It's all farm, all, almost all produce and meat and stuff that I've, is from the farm. I was like, this is kind of off brand for me, but I really want to do it. So I called it the late, lazy late lunch a lot of alliteration, but, uh, but I thought it was fun and it actually is sold out. You know, I had 20 people come for the, for the lunch and, you know, I ended up actually making a little bit of money off of that cause I, cause the ingredients were pretty inexpensive. So marketing is important, even if it's a one-off event. Um, and it can really go a long way to, to come up with something clever and catchy. And last but not least, have fun. Uh, keep it fun stay positive um especially if you have other people that are working with you you know take time to if you're if you're doing a tasting or if you're tasting and, and doing like vamps on your recipe or something like that you know take the time to include everybody say hey come taste this what do you think about this or, or you know i was thinking about you know telling this joke what do you think about this joke for during the during the the class or, or seminar or something like that um, including your team, including your friends and family, getting their opinions and keeping it fun for them as well as yourself. It's going to give you that extra energy because when you're really psyched up about doing something and you're having a good time, it doesn't even feel like work. So where some, some folks might be looking at events as a way to like get out of a, of an issue, or maybe it's to just, just kind of expand or do better. Or maybe it's just for fun. If you treat it all like it's just for fun and, and kind of stay positive like that, um, your, your opportunity for success uh, is, is definitely, you know, there and you can achieve it, I think, in a, in a more, in a, in a, in a funner way. You're going to have a lot more fun. Um, FYI, this is my friend, longtime friend from high school, Chris, <laughs> that I was talking about earlier with the gelato shop. And you can see that gelato machine just over his shoulder um, there. And they are doing, they're crushing it in the gelato game right now. And I think partly, in fact, uh, too, as you can see, um, not only are they creating stuff that they really like and are passionate about, they have a lot of fun. They do fun stuff. They, got a, they have a bike with a like, cooler on the front and they ride out to the parks in the summertime and sell scoops and, and stuff out of this bicycle. And it's just, they're just doing it their way. They're having fun with it. Um, and they're, but they're not letting anything slide through the cracks. So they're being savvy about their business and their numbers at the same time. So that's valuable. Um, it, it really changes it, everything that you can possibly do. Um, when we did Flavored Nation um, recently, as Julia mentioned earlier, um, I was doing the Cedar Plank Salmon. I brought it in for the team here at Brown Paper Tickets and we had lunch a couple of different times to test the recipe and, and that kept it fun and it kept everybody engaged and interested. So I would recommend that you do that, have fun out there and uh, keep, it, keep it in your wheelhouse. So the first question is from Denise McCormack, Denise asks, is there a written text or template when offering pay what you can ticketing that encourages audience members to pay a fair ticket price for the event? Um, so, and I, I hope everybody can hear. Um, if anybody wants to chime in on the chat or in the question section to let us know that you can or cannot hear us right now, um, that would be very helpful. Um, I think what you're referring to Denise, if I'm correct, is the function in brown paper tickets, which is a, a pay what you can uh, option. Um, the, the short answer is we don't have like a text, like a, like a prefabricated text for that. Um, what I would recommend though, is um, you can set it to a minimum. Um, so if you have a bare cost for your ticket, that's like, let's say 
eight dollars um, or whatever it is. Um, that's just throwing out a number. Um, I would set it to a minimum, and then there is a price description function, and you can kind of customize that to your own verbiage and what and what you would like for people to see. Um, so you might say something to the effect of, you know, our min our minimum, uh, you know, to cover costs is eight dollars, but you know please feel free to, to pay what you think is fair. Um, we've valued this at around $12 or something to that effect. Um, that's kind of what I do for my farm party and it seems to work out okay. Great, um, so Denise also asked if the webinar will, will be recorded. Um, yes, we will have a recording of the webinar available for anyone who wants to recap or maybe send it to friends who are unable to attend. Um, our next question, Denise, I see you have another question, but we'll just sort of play popcorn. Um, the next question is from Judy. Judy asks, do you have any issues getting permits for these events? Um, as far as permitting goes, I would recommend always just checking with your local like city government. Um, your Chamber of Commerce is a really powerful resource for that kind of thing. I can, um, getting permits is usually easy as long as you have the other prerequisites that you need in place. Um, typically, I mean, it will depend on what type of event you're doing, but if you're doing like, let's say a pop-up, um, you want to get like a banquet permit, you know, and you're a lot of times we'll need a business license to, in place beforehand to do that, depending on what you're serving, who you're serving it to and, and things like that and in what jurisdiction it is. Um, a lot of different things can factor in. So like I said, your best bet is to check with your local government, um, check with your chamber of commerce, ask other businesses that, that you know, or other people in the business that you know around you, um, in your specific area, um, you know, if they've ever encountered that stuff. Sorry, sorry if that's not too helpful, but. Um, the next question is from Kenneth. Kenneth asks, when people are, when someone approaches you to use your space, what considerations are the most important for you? Um, if somebody's looking to use your space, I mean, really what you honestly have to ask yourself is, you know, can it, can it, can I accommodate what they need? First of all, if you're leaning toward, yes, I want to allow people to use my space. Um, then you're also going to want to consider what the previous question and touched on, which is, do I have the right uh, licensing for that? Um, or can they obtain the licensing for that? And that's a question and a conversation you'd probably want to have with them as well. Um, so those are probably the two most important things. Um, other than that, it comes down to resources. You know, what do they need? You know, if, if they're just doing a, um, like, a, like a, a book group, a book club or something, and they want to have a meeting there or um, something like that, you know, maybe you just have enough tables and chairs and you can open up in the, in the you know, early, earlier than you normally would um, or on a day that you would normally be closed. And that's really kind of the basis of the, the concept behind this webinar is that you're closed certain hours of the day, certain days of the week, maybe. So, you know, does it work for you? Great. Our next question is from Helen and Helen wants to know, are there any recommended resources like books for those just starting out? Um, this would be for occasional dinners, cooking classes for adults and kids or other events in the non restaurant space. Um, there, there's a couple of different blog pieces that I've put up um, on Brown Paper Tickets blog roll that you might find useful. Um, one's on teaching cooking classes, um, and there's, there's a couple other ones. Uh, there's actually one on alternative uses for your, your space, um, which um, I think was linked through um, a lot of our marketing efforts with this and we can certainly make available afterwards. Um, other than that, you got to get out there and find things that kind of relate to your specific style, I would say. Um, what I often do is I kind of just go through and read the articles and try to match the information against other, you know, try to try to find common themes that, that strike a chord with me um, to, to determine the best way to get started. If you are, once again, interested, in, uh, I am making myself available to anybody that's attending this webinar. Um, I'm happy to do one-on-one, -on -one, like speak with you over the phone or, or correspond via email or whatever that takes to help give you some guidance if you'd like. So that's always there too. And as Patrick mentioned, um, we have a lot of material and content available on the Brown Paper Tickets blog, which we post to our social media. Um, we also release a lot of 
event tips um, on a pretty weekly basis. So there are a lot of resources out there. And again, as Patrick mentioned, feel free to reach out to him um, or anyone at Brown Paper Tickets for that matter. Um, we're here to help you and we wanna make sure that your events go smoothly and you have a great experience. So the next question, we're gonna circle back to Denise. Um, Denise wants to know, how do you get people to come if you don't have a contact list? Well, you have to build a contact list is the short answer. Um, and then additionally, uh, you can post, posting your event through brown paper tickets or through, you know, and using social media and things like that to market, that helps you build a contact list. So oftentimes, whether you realize it or not, you have a contact list already. Um, and if you're just getting started, you're, you're going to need to build that any way that you can. So the best way that I can mention, not, not to hammer it too, too heavy, but if you're registering online for your events through brown paper tickets, we actually, the system will save all of your contacts. And you can download those um, into a database file. Um, which you can then use with with MailChimp or any other marketing tool that you're using to do e-blasts or you know it, to, to keep in up and in touch with the, the contact list that you do have so every time you have a new person on your list that's made available to you and you get to keep those resources as you go through your event um, producing career and that's how you grow your list. So I guess that's the short answer or the long answer to the short question. <laughs> yeah, and just sort of to add to that from a marketing standpoint, utilize things like your followers on Twitter or your followers on Instagram. You can also make an event page on your Facebook um, and just invite your friends. And if you, you know, wanna have more attendees, have your friends invite more friends, make it like a public event. So. Um, as Patrick said, you probably already have a contact list available, um, especially in your social medias. So uh, there are a lot of different avenues for you to explore when it comes to finding attendees. And again, we have some more resources specifically on how to grow event attendance, as well as um, tips in terms of social media promotion on our blog. Oh, we also just one more thing to add. We also do have, if you are using ground paper tickets, we have a, a promotional team that's available and they are here and it's completely free um, when you're using our service um, and they will help walk you through it from everything from writing a press release to using those social media tools. So once again, we have a lot of resources that so we'd be happy to, to help you guys out. So we have about 10 more minutes left in the hour. If there are any other questions, um, feel free to chime in now. So we'll wait for a little bit just in case we missed some. Um, but in the meantime, um, Patrick is very much available to help anyone um, with setting up these events or just chatting one-on-one -on -one about getting started. Um, and we'll pull up his contact information. Oh, Stephanie. Stephanie wants to know, is there an insurance company that Brown Paper Tickets recommends for event insurance or one-day event liability? Unfortunately, uh, no. Um, I don't. I don't endorse any specific. For, I, I mean, that's. I mean, personally, I don't endorse anything specific. We're not really prepared for to to endorse any insurance companies like that. Um, I would say shop around. I mean, that's that's the tough part with insurance is that it's going to change from region to region. Um, it's going to change from what type of business you have to to one from one to another. For example, restaurants are going to have to have completely different kind of insurance than uh, than you know something that's not open to the public or serving food to the public. So, um, sorry if that's not very much help. But um, just like with a contractor, I would say get at least three quotes and don't don't dedicate to anything until you've done all your research. <laughs> all right. So yeah, in conclusion, thanks everyone for joining us. Patrick, did you want to wrap up or do you have any last minute? Um, yeah, like I said before, you know, it's gonna be, it's, it's gonna be a different journey for each person. And, um, you know, th through the seven years that I've been working with different event producers at Brown Paper Tickets, um, I've noticed that, you know, the universal truths are, are basically what I've shared with you today. Um, but there's a lot of things that can pop up. You know, there's a lot of, oh man, I, I never even saw that one coming. So 
if you do find that that's this position you're in, once again, I'm, that's what I do. So I'm happy to help out with that. Um, I'm here to answer questions. We also have a staff here 24 hours a day um, at Brown Paper Tickets that you can call. You can call on the phone. You'll get a live rep right away. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not that whole endless. You know, leave a message and we'll call you back thing. We have people here that care. Um, all the people that I work with here um, have do their own events and they're they're passionate about what they're doing. They're not just you know in some some tech call center and haven't had any experience. Everybody here at Brown Paper Tickets is involved in the events community. Um, so I would uh, use your resources, you know, and whatever resources that is, is it your, your niece or nephew or your uncle or aunt or mother or father or sister or brother or best friend or, or coworker, uh, you know, any resource that, or any person that you know in your life, it, it can be a resource. And so, Get, getting out there and being vocal and, and just kind of laying it out for folks when you're trying to get started with this, it raises awareness um, about what you're doing, what your intentions are and, and what you're trying to do. And you never know, you might run across somebody that's like, oh man, I've totally done that before. I'd love to help you out. Hey, do you need, do you need, what do you need? Tell me. What You'd be surprised, you know, there, there are people out there that you probably know very well that you may not realize, you know, are interested in, in producing events. So I guess if I were going to leave you with any information, it would be, yeah, use your resources um, and keep trying, even if it doesn't go right the first time, <laughs> you know, it might not. So just don't give up and, uh, and believe in yourself. You can do it. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I did post your email in our chat, but for those of you who want to write it down, um, you can reach Patrick at Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C-K, at brownpapertickets.com. Um, and make sure, if you haven't already, to like and follow us on social media. We try to put out content on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, as Patrick said, you can use brown paper tickets to host an event, but also go and attend some events and see what is happening in your local community. And maybe you'll find some bits of inspiration from events that you attend. So um, thank you so much again, Patrick, uh, for thank presenting. You. And yeah, for those of you who um, are tuned in, you can find a recording of the webinar um, after we wrap up here and um, have a great rest of your Monday.